Chapter Twenty Six, Down Among the Dead. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lost City, by Joseph E. Badger Jr. Chapter Twenty Six, Down Among the Dead. Ixley spoke with a degree of earnestness which left no room for doubt, even if the young man's own keen sense of hearing had not given warning but an instant later. Ominous sounds came from the entrance, which had served them but so brief a time gone by, and Bruno knew that, even if they had escaped being seen while thus attempting to win such a gruesome refuge, the possibility of their having elected just such a line of flight had occurred to some of the redskins. Gillespie heard the heavy doors open, then clang to again. He was fairly confident that some of the Aztecs had entered, although as yet the utter darkness hindered further recognition. "'What next, Ixley?' he whispered, lips almost touching the face of his young guide, as they stood close together in the murk. They can't take me alive. Is it fight, or—' "'No fight yet,' gently breathed the Aztec in turn. "'They look. That not make sure fine. They try see. We try not see all time. They come, we go, like this.' Catching a hand within his own clasp, Ixley led Bruno away in that utter darkness, seemingly well acquainted with the lay of the ground, although it quickly became evident that there must be more than one direct passage. Bruno felt convinced that there were other chambers turning at right angles to their present course, though it might have bothered the young man to give entirely satisfactory reasons for such belief. Ixley did not flee fast nor far, in that first spurt pausing shortly to turn face towards the rear, a low musical chuckle coming through his lips. "'They come, look, cut no eyes for seeing dark,' he explained, barely loud enough for Bruno to catch his meaning. We play fool them all. That be fun. He fun all time over. Ixley was scarcely as precise of speech while under the influence of excitement as when he had ample time in which to pick and choose his words, but there was little room for mistaking his meaning, which, after all, is fairly sufficient. But this time the young brave was in error, for only a few moments later both fugitives caught sight of a dim light and hurried motion far towards the entrance to these underground crypts. That warned them of added peril, and Ixley's chuckle died abruptly away. "'They'll fetch us now,' grimly muttered Bruno, shaking his fairly athletic shoulders and fingering the knife at his belt, as though making preparations for an inevitable struggle. "'All right. They may kill, but I'll furnish some red paint for my tombstone anyway.' It may be doubted whether Ixley fully appreciated this conclusion, yet he divined something of what was spoken, and made swift response. "'No kill yet. They look. behind. Maybe not find. Maybe play fool all over, yes.' "'Where can we hide that lights won't ferret us out, though? If a fellow might only have the same advantage, here in this darkness I'm not worth a sick kitten.' Just a bit disgustedly came the words, but Bruno was not giving over in weak despair. No matter how vast the odds might show against him, he would put up a gallant fight as long as he could lift his hand or strike a blow. Still, he was by no means anxious for the crisis to arrive. He would far rather run than fight, under existing circumstances, but whither and how? Ixley took it upon himself to solve the perplexing enigma, in a whisper bidding his white brother to follow with as little sound as might be, once more hurrying away through the gloomy blackness, which was by no means rendered more agreeable to Bruno by that fleeting glimpse of the dead men's bones. There was little room left for doubting the truth. Their presence in the death-cells surely was more than suspected, judging from the actions of yonder redskins, who flashed the light over and into each angle and corner, each niche and jog, where a human being might possibly seek concealment. They were not so many in number, but still a larger force than could well be met with success by two youths, even granting that Ixley would turn lethal weapons against his own people, which Bruno felt was by no means a settled fact. 
For some little time the young man kept without that limited circle of light, watching each movement made by the searchers, and at the same time taking care that none of the little party stole a dangerous march upon them by hastening in advance of the lights. Ixley apparently enjoyed the affair much as a child might a successful game of I spy, for he emitted occasional chuckles and let fall soft whispers which, if caught by other ears, certainly would not have deeply benefited the fugitives when captured. Thanks to that slow progress rendered thus by the care and minuteness of the search, Bruno began to marvel at the extent of the catacombs, and almost involuntarily calculate how many centuries it must have taken to accumulate such enormous quantities of remains. For, thanks to yonder prying light, he could see how high those grim relics of perishing mortality were piled up in tears, with here and there upright skeletons in position of greater prominence. Perhaps Gillespie might have been better able to appreciate Ixley's amusement, had he even an inkling as to how this game of hide-and-go-seek was fated to end. That an end must come, eventually, was a foregone conclusion. And then— He ventured to ask Ixley how they were to escape detection when they could retreat no farther. But before an answer could be fairly shaped, that end seemed actually upon them. Without sound or warning of any sort, another bright light showed at a considerable distance in the opposite direction, and as Bruno stared that way, he made out several armed warriors who appeared to be engaged in that same occupation, searching that city of the dead for the living. Thus caught between two fires there seemed only one course to pursue, and with the courage of his fathers Bruno spoke in low grim tones to his young guide. "'No use for you to join in the mix, Ixley. "'I'll do the best I know how, but if I can't make the riffle, "'if I go down for good and all, I ask you to convey the news to my friends. "'You will.' "'But Ixley was not at the end of his resources, and gripping a wrist, "'he urged Bruno towards yonder second light, "'speaking hastily as they moved along towards the edge of that wide passage. "'No fight yet. Best hide. Maybe no find. Dad best try first. "'Then Ixley fight like white brother fast.' There was time for scant speech, for just then the two parties seemed for the first time to catch sight of each other, and while the brave bearing the rude lantern still maintained his slow movements, searching well as he came, the other Indians came in advance, giving the fugitives barely time in which to crouch down under temporary cover. The moment these enemies had passed them by, Ixley urged Bruno on, then in swift whispers instructed him how to perfect his hiding, even aiding the young pale-face into one of the upright crypts, back of a grim skeleton, the mouldering blanket assisting in covering the one of flesh and blood. After like fashion the Aztecs sought cover on the opposite side of the passage, None too quickly, either, for now the single searcher drew dangerously nigh, peering into every practicable hiding-place on either side, before moving onward. Little by little he drew closer, while the other band of searchers apparently turned off into a side passage, or large chamber, since nothing could be seen or heard of them by the fugitives. In all probability, Ixley's bold ruse would have proved a complete success, for the Aztec warrior showed no suspicion as he drew nearer, but it was not to be thus. Fairly holding his breath, lest he disturb some of the dry bones immediately in front of himself, Bruno waited and hoped only to feel his blood chill and his heart fail him as a sickening horror crept over his brain, nor was that the only creeping thing worse luck. Past all room for doubting, his entrance into that crypt had disturbed the repose of a snake of some description, for now he could feel the loathsome reptile crawling slowly up his back, turning the skin beneath to scorching ice in its horrid passage. One horrible nightmare minute that lasted, then the serpent paused upon his shoulder and biceps, touching his cheek with nose, then drawing back its ugly head to give an ominous hiss. Human flesh and blood could endure no more, and Bruno flung the snake violently off, striking forcibly against that mass of dry bones as he did so. With a rattling clatter, the skeleton lost its frail coherence, 
and tumbled outward, leaving Bruno fairly exposed within the niche. With a cry the Aztec warrior turned in that direction, but ere he could fetch his light to bear upon the right spot, Ixley sprung forth to the rescue, hooting like a frightened owl as he dashed the light to earth, and at the same time deftly tripping the Indian headlong. Swift as thought itself, he followed up the advantage thus won, smiting the fallen brave heavily upon the crown with a clubbed thigh-bone, depriving him of sensibility for the time being at least, and then snatching up the still-burning light he called in guarded tones to his white friend. "'Come, brother, play hunt now. Fast, not stop here. Dat bad for you, see by dem so soon. Dat could you go, like this way.' Scarcely realizing just what fresh ruse the Aztec had in mind, but far from recovered from that horrible fear of death from poisonous fangs, Gillespie submitted, Ixley hurrying him away, turning off into what appeared to be a side passage, less spacious than that to which they had until then confined their retreat. The young Aztec hastily explained his present scheme, which was to play the role of searchers as well, and scarcely had he made that project known, than another difficult test was offered their courage. End of chapter 26